All right, down about 15 seconds here. We're gonna get rolling. All right, welcome everybody. Hey, do you guys like that countdown clock? I just added the countdown clock. Is that cool? Just to kind of, you know, just get everything going. Uh, got some great questions here. By the way, let me know where you're from. I got India in the house. I got Kenya in the house. Uh, India's always in the house, man. Like, I love India. Like I said, man, you guys are always cool. Got Harry. Moshiri. Did I get that right, man? Representing Kenya. Very cool, man. Very cool. All right. Man, this, you know, Chris, this is such a, you know, this right here, Chris, this is awesome. That right there, man, that is a great question. I'm going to answer that. And by the way, you're absolutely correct, man. You're, you get it, man. You're like, you get it. Uh, I might even answer that before we get started, man. So, because that's such a great question. It's so insightful that you picked that up, man. So, bam, high five. And then... There's this gentleman right here. This guy is awesome, Bobby Henry. He's uh, Henry, Henry rather. Uh, so Bobby and I have known each other for like, I don't know, three, four years, five years, who knows. Bobby's a guitar player. He has a website called Chord Savvy. So if you wanna learn how to play guitar, that's the guy to learn from. He is like the ultimate speaker, entertainer, and he's a smart guy. All right, Bobby, thanks for joining, man. Appreciate you. And so the 254, you're too funny, man. You're too funny with the 254. All right, Sankit said, let's go. Victor, stop wasting time. Let's do this, man. Thank you for your patience, man. I appreciate it. Uh, Faith30 says, so cool, man. Thank you, Faith. All right, so, hey, by the way, so it's Monday. Thought I'd come up on a Monday. I don't usually do Mondays, but I was feeling it. And again, I know some of you guys are asking me for schedules, but it's when the mood hits me, man. I just don't want to get on a schedule and do it and be forced to do it. You know what I mean? So, hey, let me know. Uh, it's Monday. Uh, some of you may be Monday Eve already, wherever you're at in the, country, in the world. Hey, can you just really quick, really quick, do this for me. What's the one thing you want to get done this week? Just want, but make it short, real short. Give me one thing you want to get done this week, and then we're going to jump into this, okay? One thing you want to get done this week. And then, uh, Chris, I'm going to answer that question because uh, it's such a good question, man. It's like, I just can't let that one go. And you're coming from Greece, man, so my man. Uh, but one thing you guys want to get done this week, because uh, sometimes I like learning from you guys. We got Mark Ray is from Sydney, Australia. That's how you say it, right, man? <laughs> Sydney, Australia, right? That's cool, man. That's cool. I love that. I love that. And so I want to leave this one up here because I really want to answer that question, Chris. So don't let me get away with men. You know, retype it in if I forget to answer that question, okay? Uh, you got Macon, Macon, Georgia. Tracy Collins from Macon, Georgia. This is awesome. Way to go, Tracy. Welcome, welcome, welcome. And I'm going to get started in just a little bit here because I know you guys, sales account management, please. Sankit, you're killing me with this stuff. I got, I got to do that. You know what? I'm going to do that. Sankit, I'm not going to talk about it. Um, what I'm going to do is sales account management. I'm going to put it on the schedule so I can discuss it. Because I already have something in mind I want to talk about today, Sanket. So uh, hang in there with me, man. I'm going to cover your topic. Uh, let me see. New Jersey in the house. I got Gupta from India in the house. Bobby Hennebury is going to negotiate licensing deals for his songs, man. So hey, Bobby, just type in, what is it? Courtsavvy.com. So check out his website. Bobby's a cool dude, man. I mean, you, you meet some good people in, in life, and Bobby's one of those people you meet. All right, so let me see what else we got. Uh, Sanket, okay, good. I'm glad you're patient, man. Thank you, man. I appreciate that. Another, M. Nafis. I think I got that right from India. And then, the ultimate, there she is again. Dinero and motivacion. That's money and motivation. You got to love her, man. Colombia, right? If I got it right, remind me. And we got my man from Kenya, Mawanya. Love it, man. If you don't take care of your customers, someone else will. Dude, that is a, that is a perfect... Uh, <laughs> Why don't we just kind of leave that one up for a little bit? If you don't take care of your customers, somebody else will. That's like in life, right? Uh, Tarun, Tarun's always here, man. Tarun's awesome, man. Thank you, man. Uh, there you go. De Niro says, no, Victor. Playa de Carmen. Sorry, got it. Like I said, I've been there once. Beautiful. Mexico's just gorgeous, man. Mexico's like, if you've never been to Mexico, Mexico City especially, and understand the history of Mexico, you're missing out. I mean, it's, it's, it's a great country, great history. Uh, Mark Reyes says, I want to negotiate the terms of my employment with my current employer in this new venture we're entering. Dig it, man. Oh, I love it, man. You're focused on that. That's a, a, exceptional, man. 
finish my cold calling email sales copy. Copywriting for your emails. I love it, man. By the way, on that one, Albert, I get a lot of emails. And tell me if, you, if some of you on here get a lot of these emails where people always like want something from you. Does that happen to you a lot? Because that happens to me a lot. I get emails and people, they always start out with, congratulations, Victor. I think what you're doing is awesome, right? You know, congratulations on your book. Congratulations on your video. And then they go, then they always ask for something. Like, can you do this for me? And I'm like, I don't even know you, right? And so I think somewhere in the copywriting, there has to be this warming up foreplay part that has to help. Uh, and then Reza Wolf says, sell it ain't hard when you know how. You got it, brother, man. Reza Wolf, what a name. I love that one. So yeah, man, finish that up. Anyway, so let me answer, uh, let me go back all the way up here. I want to answer this because this is such a great question. And then I'm going to jump into how do we steal comp from the competition ethically, right? Steal ethically. I love that. All right, Chris. Chris, are you still on, man? Let me know you're still on, man. Just hit me with a one on the bottom if you're still on, man. I want to know you're still here. If I'm going to answer this question, dang it, Chris, you better still be here. Okay? So, cool. You got the audible mentions. And my Bible, what is your Bible? Uh, anyway, so I'm going to answer this question. It's such a great question. It, it's it's because I, I want you guys to be successful in selling in today's market. This is why I'm taking this question. I'm just going to deviate a little bit. Some kids probably saying, why don't you deviate with sales account planning next time? So read this. He says, hi, Victor. I just read the challenger sale, which I highly recommend you read. And I found it to be the opposite of spin selling. Am I right? If so, why does Neil Rackham support the challenger sale? Chris from Greece. Oh, dude, you, you're so on it. You're so uh, bright. So uh, it's not in our roadmap for this year. Okay. So, so Chris, here's, you're so right. And the thing is, I know you read it because you read it, you understand it. So let's go back a little history here real quick. And again, everybody, I'm going to explain what these two things are and why Chris is feeling conflicted at this point, but why he truly understands. See, Neil Rackham's book came out, I think in like 87, you can correct me if I'm on that year, but it's back then. And back then, remember, there really wasn't an internet. There wasn't people accessing information. So he came up based on this study supported by Xerox, uh, this model called spin selling. And so spin selling is basically, you know, understand the customer situation. That's why you go in there and you ask a lot of questions. This is important. Remember that part. You go in there and you ask a lot of questions. In that question and answer session, you are going to discover a problem, typically a problem you can solve. Right? So now you've identified the problem. So you've asked a lot of questions, right? You've identified a problem. That's the P in spin selling. And then you talk about the implications of not solving that problem. Like, Mr. Customer, how much is, is that costing you? Every day you don't do something, how much is that costing you? How is it impacting your business? So forth and so on. And then people freak out, right? Because you're telling them all these problems that they're having, all the money they're losing. But sometimes when you do that, you scare them so much that they just freeze. So then you go to the end part, which is the need payoff. The need payoff, how would it look if we were able to fix this? What would it do for your business? What would it do for you, right? That's been selling. Situation, problem, implication, need payoff, end on a positive side. The need payoff is like the positive side. How you, If we were to solve this, if we were to fix this, what would that mean for your business? What would that mean for you? What would that mean for your organization? That's been selling. Now, fast forward, the reason Chris is bringing this up is that Neil Rackham wrote that book. I think Neil Rackham is like, and I think I've mentioned this in the past, to me, he's like the gold standard. He is the gold standard of sales training. Yes, I said it. I have a gold standard, and he is that. He is that guy. You know, to me, I look at him and Mac Hannon, because people always ask me, you know, who, who really, who do you really like respect in terms of sales? So, if you look at, and I'll just spell these out, it, it's Neil Rackham, right? And Neil Rackham, again, is known for spin selling, right? For spin selling. Bear with me on this. Bear with me. And then there's Mac which most people don't even know who this guy is, but this guy was way ahead of his time. He wrote a book, Consultative, Consultative Selling, right? And this book right here, I'm telling you, now let me get this out of the way here. I'm gonna push you down here, Chris. So this right here, Consultative Selling, is still the most, I'll just say, I don't wanna say ripped off book, <laughs> But it's the most ripped off book because Matt Cannon, who wrote this, and I think it was like 82, 83, was so ahead of his time that this book not only applied then, it applies today. That said, Chris, back to your question. So Neil Rackham wrote this back in, let's say, 87, right? 
So then fast forward 2011, 2011 to get the Challenger sale. The Challenger sale was written and basically this one, the, by the way, the guy who wrote the forward in the book was Neil Rackham. But the Challenger sale basically is, all, I don't want to say opposite to spin selling, but it really goes against what spin selling was promoting. So the question is, why would Neil Rackham write the forward to the Challenger sale when it really goes against a lot of what spin selling was? This is important because Neil Rackham is a smart guy and Neil Rackham knows how to evolve. See, Neil Rackham, when, if you really listen to some of his explanations on why he wrote the forward for the Challenger sales, here's basically what he says. And I'm giving you the short version, not doing him justice. He said, look, back, back then, before the internet, you had to go in there and ask a lot of questions to identify the problem. The S and the P. With me? The S and the P. Well, today, fast forward, everybody has an internet, you can do the research. So if you walk into a client's office asking questions, trying to identify the problem, S and P, the customer's going, you should have known that before you walked in the door. Why are you asking me these questions? Because I got 50 other salespeople asking me the same thing. So what the challenger sales says basically is this, you're going to go in there not asking a lot of questions, situation, problem to figure that out. You're going to walk on in there understanding what the situation is and what the problem is already. Your job, now let's look at the eye, is to highlight the implication, but also the challenger sales says, add insight. Make the customer go, huh, I didn't think about it. And then talk about the implication. So the, where, where it's different right now, Chris, is that the S&P you should do before you get there. That's why. So Neil Rackham, I think is, I mean, isn't that the sign of a great, uh, I guess, coach, teacher, mentor, somebody who evolves with time and says, you know what, what I used to say, is no longer valid because times have changed. That's why I respect Neil Rackham. That's my short answer. Uh, this one's, hi, Victor, fascinating stuff from you. Helped me with my job in retail last year, but I want to take my skills to the next level to compete experience with people in years of experience. How do I do that? Big question, man. But anyway, so I wanted to answer that one first. And hopefully I, Chris, hopefully that helps a little bit. Chris from Greece. And thank you on this one. Uh, next step to the next level, I mean, hang out with me. All right. So now, let me get into the topic, because then you guys get mad at me if I don't cover the topic, right? The topic at hand. Let's cover the topic at hand. Are you with me? All right. So, how do we steal competition? By the way, if I don't respond right away and you're saying good morning, I'll read them later. So, good morning to you guys. Thank you for joining me. But let me get into the content, and then I'll slow down, take a little break, and do some things with you. Hold on one second. Hold on one second. I got to get comfortable when I do these things. So, I usually have like a footstool. I have a footstool down here that I just keep, I, I rest my foot on yeah, there it goes. Okay, feel better. All right, so let's talk about the competition, right? Because what's happening in the market right now is, is you know, the market's starting to shift. Have you felt it already? The market's starting to shift. And because the market is starting to shift, what's happening is we now have to figure out how to sell in today's market. And so people are kind of going, well, how do we get the economy going? You know, how do we get our sales going again? Because if you think about it, if you think about it, okay, we're doing this in the year 2020, right? I'm highlighting this for future viewers, right? So we'll see this in the future. And so Q1 was fantastic. I don't know about you, but my Q1 was way up. I'm like, like that way up, okay? I was celebrating Q1, I was like, yeah. But towards the end of March, the COVID became a reality, the pandemic became a reality. And now, like most of you probably, Q2 was what? Like that. That's what we've experienced. But as we're moving through June, and I remember mentally telling myself, let's wait to mid-year, see where we're at. And so now what's happening is we're getting here. We're at June, right? July, we begin the third quarter. So my question to you is, what do you have planned for this? How do we prepare for these two quarters right here? How do we prepare? And so here's what I want to ask. If you know this already, if you know this already, that we have the, right now, you're playing catch up because this is pretty much I mean, if you're Netflix, if you're Zoom, you know, some of these businesses that really flourished during this pandemic, good for you, excellent, right? But for a lot of us, this was like a nuclear winter, right? Business, like, just tanked. So now, what I wanna talk about is right here, Q3, but we still got a month here called June, right? It's only like June, what, eight, nine, 10, whatever it is today. So all of a sudden, I wanna take advantage of June so I can kick into Q3 and we get going. So, 
Years ago, I wrote a book called Winning Back the Business. And Winning Back the Business, if you go to, by the way, don't forget, if you go to my website, the Sales Velocity Academy, if you're a member already of my program, which you should be, uh, there's a book called Winning Back the Business. Winning Back the Business is how do you get the business back or take it away from your competition? So that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about grabbing business from your competition ethically, right? And so what I want to do is like give you the mindset and then let's begin to create a roadmap and give you some ideas. All I'm going to do is throw ideas out at, at you and then you're going to give me your ideas. So I'm going to learn from you as well. Are we cool with that? Cool. All right. So the first thing we want to do is let's take advantage of the fact that a lot of our competitors are, you know, uh, trying to get business. They're struggling also, but a lot of them are sitting back because they already have the customer. So let's set this up. Let's say that Here's a, a customer you want. I'll call him the ideal client, right? Here's your client. You've been trying to get into this client. This is you trying to get into that client, but your competitor is already there, right? Your competitor is already there. They've claimed that. That's them right there. Now, what typically happens is that competitor, you know clients don't want to change who they're buying from. So this is their vendor of choice, right? This is why you often get people saying, I'm happy with my current supply. I don't want to change, right? There's no need to change, right? So there's always this fear of change. But what's happening now to this client? Because we're going through the pandemic, many of these clients are trying to do one of three things. And you know what they are if you're in the B2B and you've listened to me often enough. Remember the, remember the value trinity? They're trying to find ways to increase revenue, reduce costs, or expand market share. That's what they're trying to do, right? They're trying to do that. Also keep in mind, would you agree that money is tight for these customers? Is money tight? Yeah. Why? Because there's a lot of uncertainty. Now think about it. Now, if you're, if you're watching me, do this visually with me. It helps when you do it like this. Put your hands like this. Come on, man. Put them up. Put them up like this. He says, this is a customer's brain. There's always like a balance of certainty and anxiety certainty and anxiety. And when there's the equal amount of certainty and anxiety, people won't make a buying decision. If there's too much anxiety, they're definitely not gonna make a buying decision. But let's say the customer's right here, certainty and anxiety, they're in the freeze mode, they're not doing anything. What if you can find a way to increase their certainty and reduce their anxiety? That's selling. So how can we help our clients? First of all, step one is, this is the mindset. They're looking for solutions right now. They're looking for solutions. And what typically happens is your competitors, your competitors pull back. Why do they pull back? Because they go, well, client's not buying. So, you know, it is what it is. We'll just wait for next quarter to kick in. See, now is the time. This is like, again, some Sun Tzu stuff, art of war stuff. You know, where the, right now is the time to go after those clients that you've always wanted that your competitor has locked up. So I want you to do this. Think about, because that's the mindset first. We're going to go after that business ethically. Your competitor is relaxed and not doing much, maybe not even visiting. But what if right now, step number one, let's say step number one is I want you to ID. I want you to identify. Again, this is specific if you're in B2B. I want you to identify, you know, maybe three, five, ten clients that you've been dying to get into. You've been dying to get into that you haven't been able to penetrate. Let's get that list first. Draw up that list. Who are these 10 clients that always bought from the competitor that I can't get the business from? Now, if we understand that, if we know who they are, then the second thing, and I think step number two is, what if you, be, you get creative here? Here's what we're gonna get in the best. In fact, I'm gonna give this another page. Step one, ID. So let's go step one. We're gonna identify, let's say your top 10, right? Top 10, it could be 100 you know, whatever it is, top 10, top 100 clients, you've been dying to go after, right? You've been dying to go after. Now, the question is, how do you go after them, right? So here, what I want to do is go into your database. And by the way, if you don't have a CRM, you should. Second, I want you to get creative here. Here's where we're going to get creative together. We're going to do this together, right? This is going to be fun. We're going to get creative. We're going to put together, let's just call it an offer they can't refuse. Sounds very Godfather-like, right? What if we could put together an offer they can't refuse? Let's you and I think about this thing. How can we, the thing is, it's okay to visit these customers, but what they're looking for is they need help. They're struggling right now. They're trying to increase revenue, reduce costs, expand market share, and they're trying to save money, right? So they're holding on to their money. They don't know what to do. Certainty, anxiety, they're freaking out. What do we do? 
Now you can imagine that if you're talking to, let's say a manager, even a VP level, maybe even a CXO of some sort, they got a lot of pressure on them to try to find, you know, find ways to make things happen. So when you call your customers or you call these people, don't just show up and say, how can we help? That's not helping. When you say, how can we help? That's not helping because you're forcing them to think about how you can help them. But what if we figured out and arrived there with an actual solution? Do you know what I mean? What if we arrived with an actual proposal? So let's think through some of these things. Let's think through some of these and I'll show you what I've done in the past that's worked. So if I'm trying to penetrate a customer, I got to get creative. I know that the resistance is going to be, we're happy with our current supplier. I get that. But right now, they need help. What if I came in with a creative proposal? So let's go with the easy stuff first. If I came in with a proposal, is there any way that I can put together some type of financing for them to want to buy my product? Is there anything I can do that? By the way, I'm throwing these questions up in the air because everybody's business who's watching this right now is a little different. But what if I come up with a, a, some financing scheme, right? You know, no payment till next year. Maybe instead of net 30, it means pay in 30 days, I go net 60, pay in 60 days, pay me net 90, right? it could be net six months, whatever it may be. What financing idea do you have? Because maybe they love your product, but money's tight right now. So we're thinking long term. Second, let's go with, how about bundling? This is an interesting one, right? You know, if you sell one product, it's one price. You put two together, you smash them together, and you can give them a better deal. But maybe that's what we need to look at. Maybe there's some bundling going on here that you need to do. Is there anything that you can bundle together to actually put together a better deal? Now, here's what's interesting about bundling. If we can explore, explore bundling, this is under my, uh, by the way, I got a great course on pricing strategies in the Sales Velocity Academy. And one of the things I talk about is bundling. And so let me explain bundling for a second. The thing is, if I were to buy, I'm gonna explain it simple. If I were to buy a burger, right? That would be one price. Let's call that five bucks, right? Five bucks, right? Now, if I were to buy fries by itself, I'm just making these numbers up, that would be two bucks, right? These are fries. Let me see, see if I can drive fries. Yeah, that's fries. You get the idea, right? Fries. Now, if I buy a Coke, which I don't buy, right? But if I was to buy a Coke, you know, that's a straw right there. Uh, and then this would be like, I don't know, we'll call that $3 by itself if it was large, right? So total, if I buy these individually, if I buy these individually, you look at up, you're looking at $10, right? And then let's say that your, your, you know that your profit margin on each of these will vary, okay? This is like mini MBA pricing right now, what we're doing, right? So each of these will actually give you a different price. So that said, let me do this real quick. That said, what I want to do is I want to create a bundle. And a bundle is basically this. I'm going to take all these three and I'm going to sell them for a bundle. I'm going to put together a package and sell them for, let's say, $7. We see this like at, like at McDonald's, Wendy's, whatever, any restaurant, right? We call this bundling. Now, here's what's interesting about bundling. Individually, my profit margins may be higher or lower but here I can recalculate a new profit margin. So for example, I could be making, you know, th I'm making these numbers up, 30% profit here, 10% profit here, and probably 80% profit here. Why 80%? Because that's sugar to water. That's all it is, right? So 30, 10, but when I bundle them, maybe my profit margin now is 35% and I can live with that. So I can try to sell this product here, or let's just go to the Coke. I can try to sell a lot of Cokes at 80%, or maybe I can bundle them and actually what? Put something out in the market that's more reasonable and more enticing to the customer. So another idea, just throwing it out there. So there's financing, then there's bundling. Let me see if I can erase some of this stuff so I can write on this thing. Not you, hold on a second. So let me just erase this. You guys got that, right? So that's bundling. Hopefully you got that, you wrote that down, right? So that's bundling. Now, what's another strategy? So let's go for another strategy. So that's two strategies so far. Another one might be, how about you do some type of swap out, a buyback, a swap out or a buyback. I'll just call it a swap out, and I'll explain this, or a buyout, right? So a swap out or a buyout is, 
let's say that, again, using an example of they have product X, right? Now, the customer's already paid, I'm going to use uh, $10,000 for this product, right? They've already paid $10,000 for this product. And so you're coming in and your product is, let's say, $12,000. It could even be $9,000. Pick your number. It doesn't matter. Either way, the customer's thinking, I just invested $10,000 in that product and you're telling me to swap it out. I've had it for a year. It's working fine. Why would I swap it out? I just spent $10,000. This is what is known as a sunk cost, right? In other words, I've already spent it and you're telling me that I need to spend more and I, I don't want to do that. So that's sunk cost, right? So what you can do is say, Mr. Customer, I said, what you can do, let me raise sunk cost here for a second. What I can do is I know this is after you've shown your value, you've proven that your product is better and it could help the client increase revenue, reduce costs, expand market share, right? Now, so you've already demonstrated this. Now, here's the problem. They don't want to buy it because they've already sunk their cost in. We've all had that. Have you ever had that situation where, um, you know, you buy something and then you already invested in it, but I'm like, yeah, I should have bought that one, but I, I already bought this one, so I don't want that one. We've all had that, right? Like buyer's remorse. Or I should say, no, that's not right. That's buyer's regret. You know, I regret not buying the other thing. By the way, there is a difference. Buyer's remorse and buyer's regret. Two different things. One is buyer's remorse is, oh, I shouldn't have bought it. Buyer's regret, I should have got the other one. So this is a perfect example of buyer's regret. So they've already stuck $10,000. God, you know, Victor, I really like your product better, but oh, I just don't want It's like if I bought a microphone like this one, right? And then I said, God, I wish I bought the other microphone, but I've already spent a lot of money on that microphone and I don't want to do that. So what you're going to do is say, well, I'll tell you what. I said, I see that you bought this microphone, Victor, and you spent $10,000, which I did not, right, on that microphone. What if, what if, what if I buy this one back, right? What if I buy it back at $5,000? I'm making numbers up right now, right? And then I'll give you a credit to my product, which is $15,000 right? Because it's a much better product. So now they're only really paying what? 10K. Now here's what's interesting. You may think, but wait a minute, they're going to pay 10K again. That's their mindset. No. See, that's called, they're using a different mental accounting here. If you just discount at this price to 10,000, the customer wouldn't see it as, would see it as a discount. This is subtle. Watch this. This is really subtle. This is really slick if you get it. If I had discounted my price from 15, to 10,000, the customer says, well, I paid 10,000 for that one, 10,000 for this. That's not what I'm doing here. Notice what I'm doing. I'm changing the mental accounting. And I'm saying, I will give you 5,000 for your system, which is really not earning you a lot of money. And then I'll add that to the new price and you can get it at 10,000. Big difference. And whether you believe it or not, the mindset is different. When I can separate discounting from actually Again, buying something back, the perception is totally different. I didn't discount. I gave you credit for your system. So I will take that and I will give you mine and then you'll be more efficient now. So these are three simple strategies that you can use just to actually try to win your competition back. So my question to you is, so step number one, ID the top 10, 20 clients you want to go after. Then let's find a creative proposal. And again, it could be financing. It could be bundling. It could be what? Swap out. Do you remember the story I tell about, because uh, there's also, for example, let me do this one. There's also, for example, the buyback program. And I've mentioned this in the past. The buyback program is another one that reduces anxiety. The buyback program is almost like layaway. Did you ever do layaway? If you've done layaway, you know, let me, yeah, by the way, somebody says, Reza says, like trade in, swap and buy out. Yes. Trading is like this, as long as I get credit for it, I call that a buyback, right? And so, nice way to define that. But how about the, the buyback program, in this case, is if you don't like it, you could return it. And remember, like Hyundai did this years ago, that if you, don't, if you buy the car and if you lose your job, we'll buy it back. What a creative proposal that is, right? You could also do like layaway plans, payment. Like when we talk about finance, I was, I was, I was gonna ask you, do you remember doing layaways? If you know what layaway is, put a one, man. Yeah, put a, put a one if your layaway was good. So somebody said somebody's question was good. Let me say, what is this? Sunka said, Chris Pap, your question was good. So Chris, always big discussion. I don't want to disturb the other guys here. Okay. All right. Thank you, Victor. 
but he said exactly what you said. Spin has to be adapted to the internet. Probably spin is not the opposite as, it, that's correct. You got it, Chris. All right, we digress. So we all did layaway. I remember, uh, so I'm, I think I mentioned to you, we were like poor, like poor, 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 like poor. We're talking food stamps, government cheese, and powdered milk. I mean, we're talking poor, raised in the hood of Chicago. If you know where the north side is, Humble Park, Logan Square. Uh, we're, and we were about, I'll say about a mile or two from the Cabrini Green housing projects. We were poor. And so back then, uh, my family came from Puerto Rico, so we didn't have a lot of money. And so my mother would always have to put things on layaway. And so I remember there was a store called Harvey's where you buy your cool gym shoes, cool pants and everything, and you would buy something. This never happened. You, you buy something on layaway, but it took you so long to pay for those things that it probably went out of style before you got them. So I remember like, you know, my mother would put down $2 on a gym shoe you know, for a pair of gym shoes. And it wasn't like six months later that I actually got the gym shoe. What's, by the way, what's cool about that time, well, it wasn't cool then, I, but what was cool in the sense that you didn't get into a lot of debt was, you had to pay the thing off. It wasn't like a credit card, just an impulse buy. You kept paying that thing. And after a while you started thinking, was that really worth it? So anyway, anyway, I digress, man. It's just a personal story, you know, poor story. But anyway, so these are four different strategies you can use. Did I have another one? One is, oh, so one, one last one on the creative piece, and again, sometimes you want to put in a little sweetener, if you know what I mean. And so there's a phrase called a loss leader. And a loss, if you know what a loss leader strategy is, just hit a one, let me know. A loss leader strategy is a powerful strategy. A loss leader strategy, and again, we're talking about taking competition, uh, you know, clients from your competition. We're going to get there with proposals that are very creative. Step number one is we're going to identify the top 10, top 100, whatever, clients you want to go after that you haven't been able to penetrate. But instead of getting there, instead of getting there, you know, and asking them, how can we help you? Let's go there with a creative proposal. So a loss leader is something that you know you're going to lose money on, but in the long run, you're going to win money. Or sometimes you're going to sell a product, right? Knowing that you're not going to make any money on it, really. But that's like your foot in the door, right? And so do you have a loss leader? Something that I can sell almost at cost. And even if it's a little bit low cost, that's okay. I'll explain that in just a bit. But if I can sell something just to get in, like one of the phrases I used to use all the time is, you know, my customer said, and I want you to write this phrase down. Get ready to write this phrase down. If not, if you're driving, get ready to record this phrase. This is a beautiful phrase, okay? My customer says to me, Victor, I'm happy with my current supplier, right? I'm happy with my current supplier. To which I would always say, I'm happy that you're happy. I said, and then I would just always ask the question to take control of the conversation. I said, but Mr. Customer, let me ask you a question. In business, isn't it always good to have options? Oh, that's a sweet question right there. That's a money question right there. I'm happy with my current supplier. You say, I'm happy that you're happy with your current supplier. But Mr. Customer, let me ask you a question. In business, isn't it always good to have options? What do you think they're gonna say? Yeah. They always say, yeah, Victor, it's always good to have options. I said, I want you to consider us as an option, something that's always there. Because it's not, you know, everybody knows it's not good to put all your eggs in one basket. So why not position yourself as an option? And so another way of approaching this is when I know that, I, that they're buying from one client, one customer, my, one of my competitors, and they're buying a lot. I always say to the customer that line about, isn't it always good to have options? But also I said, why don't you give us a small share of what they're, you know, what you're, you're buying from them? So if they're buying, let's say, a million dollars a year worth of business, I'm just saying, you know, throw 1% my way, throw 10% my way. I don't want a lot, just throw 10% my way, and then let us at least establish a track record with you. Does that sound reasonable? You know what they're going to say? Yeah, that sounds reasonable. Now, you have to maneuver the objections like we got to set you up in the system, uh, we got to get you approved, and all those wonderful things. Got that. But what you're doing is adjusting the customer's mind by having them cover his bets. Think about it. If the customer realizes that he's buying everything from one source, one source supplier, and one day that source supplier fails them, then that's an opportunity. Well, that's but it's not good for him. But if we frame that conversation that way, now we can position ourselves as that alternative supplier, somebody there just in case you need them. And every brain, every brain, no matter where you are in the world, wants to cover their bets, wants plan B, a backup plan. 
So if you're not number one, as they always say, position yourself at number two. Why? Because number one eventually will falter just a little bit and you're going to be right there for the customer. So keep that in mind. So maybe sometimes to get in, we have to do a loss leader and that's okay. Now, so these are five different strategies, right? Financing, bundling, swap out, buyback, uh, and the loss leader. You can probably come up with a couple of more. We can have a longer discussion on that, if you know what I mean. But let me highlight this equation for you. And this goes back to the loss leader or giving financing. Because in your mind, you're thinking, hey, yeah, you know, Victor, but I'm gonna wind up losing money, Victor. Come on, man, I'm gonna wind up losing money. This is not gonna be good for me. And it's just in the long run, it's not gonna work. Eh, you're looking at it wrong, totally wrong, if I may. So here's the equation I want you to write down. As long as your cost of acquisition is less than the customer lifetime value, this is solid. Listen, this I'm telling you, this is a formula that if you have to tattoo a formula to your body, this is the formula you want to tattoo. I am not recommending you tattoo anything to your body. But anyway, so here's the deal. I was listening to, uh, you ever see a uh, Shark Tank? Uh, Shark Tank, give me, give me a one if you've seen Shark Tank, right? Uh, so Shark Tank, uh, there's a guy, uh, was it uh, Mr. Wonderful? Is it Kevin, o, Kevin O'Leary, is that right? Kevin O'Leary, right? He was, he was doing an interview and he was talking about how he goes in to assess companies when he's going to buy them. And so, thank you, Reza. And so, and to, to buy companies. Uh, and so, one of the things he talked about, he says, look, here's one of the equations you always have to keep in mind. As long as your cost of acquiring a client is less than your customer lifetime value, this is a good deal. And it was so simple. You know how sometimes the best ideas are so simple. It's like it, sometimes we overcomplicate our world in terms of selling, marketing. And so client acquisition costs. So for example, let's say that it takes you, I don't know, let's make, make up numbers here. Let's say that in terms of time, energy, and resources, if we were to quantify all that for you to acquire a new client, like your time, your effort, you had to fly to the location, you had to meet with the customer, you had to set up a demo, you had to blah, 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 all that stuff, right? Let's just say that we were able to quantify all that and that number came out to, let's say, $3,000, right? And again, I'm just choosing numbers at random here. $3,000 to acquire that client. But let's say that the client bought from you a $500 product. Is the equation working? No, it's not working at all. But sometimes this is only what? Let's call this year one. But year two, they bought a thousand bucks. Okay, so that's year two. Is this deal working? Yes or no? Is that working? Yes or no? The answer is no, it's not working. Still not working. And then you go to year three and maybe they buy another $700 over here and you can still see that the numbers don't work. The numbers don't work. Right? So this is an example of it's not working. In other words, you've spent a lot of money to acquire a client that over the next three years only bought that much. That's a losing proposition. That's not good. And so, but what if, what if we go back to the example, we go back to the example of a, sorry about that, hold on a second. We go back to the example of you're finding the ideal client and it did cost you $3,000 to finally get in and get that client. But you offered them some type of loss leader. You offered them a product, let's say at a th they bought $1,000, and you probably made almost 0% margin, if we can exaggerate, 0% margin, you made nothing, nothing, right? But in your mind, you have, some people have a three-year time frame for measuring customer, you know, um, uh, lifetime value. Some people have a five time. Believe it or not, Starbucks, what do you think the customer lifetime value period is for Starbucks? Guess, come on. Yes, you're going to love this. So in other words, go, tell me how long. So in other words, some people say three years. I measure, you know, what they bought over the next three years. And then I measure the customer lifetime value. Some people say four. Some people say five. Some even say seven. What do you think Starbucks says? What do you think they measure? When they look at a customer that walks in the door, how many years do they see them buying from them? That's another way of putting it. In other words, they understand how much that person is going to buy. And again, they got this down to some science because using algorithms, algorithms, they can actually figure out not only what you'll buy on average, but how many times you'll visit a Starbucks and how long you'll be buying from them. Reza took a guess at 10, double that and you're good dinero and motiv motivation also. It's 20 years. 
20 years, that's their, that's their time period. So when they acquire a customer, they're looking at what they're gonna buy over 20 years. Said another way, if it took them 3,000, which I doubt it takes that, if somebody buys over the next 20 years, that's the lifetime value. So that's how we have to kind of just shift our brain. And so if they buy almost nothing, you sold them a loss leader, keep in mind, you're not making money there, but you acquired a new client and now we do the upsell and the cross sell. And then let's say in the second year, for exaggeration's sake, well, now it's $2,000. Well, we're almost at break even. I understand, there's, a, there's an economist out there going, yeah, Victor, but you're not taking into consideration the future value of money. I get that, this is a simple example. Let's keep it simple. But then, let's say that your timeline is actually five years. And then, the next year they buy 1,500, and the next year they buy another 1,000, and then they buy, I don't know, 3,000 last year. In other words, this comes out to about 10K over five years then that equation works. And so as you're putting a deal together, and again, maybe this more applies more to B2B, but it could be a recurring customer even in the B2C realm. For example, if you're into network marketing, right? And I love network marketing, by the way. It's all, it has a bad reputation, but I think it's because of what happened in the past, the pyramid scheme. Good network marketing plans work if you work them. But what if it took you, let's say, $200 to acquire a client? Let's say you did some pay-per-click search engine marketing, right? and all of a sudden you acquired somebody for 200 bucks. But if they stay on your program for let's say two years, right? So said another way, let's write it down. Cause this is, that's more of a B2B. So let's do a B2C. Let's do a B2C and let's call that network marketing. So if it's a network marketing, it could be almost the same thing, right? So it took you, let's say $200. And what you did is you did some search engine marketing, which means you did some pay-per-click, right? You did some pay-per-click, you paid for some ads. You paid for some ads and all of a sudden you acquired a client. And to get on your program, they paid $99, right? But the monthly program that you put them on is like, like 20 bucks. I'm just being simple with numbers. Well, run the numbers. I paid 200 bucks, $99 I got already, so I'm halfway there. $20 a month times 12, I think that's 140, I can't multiply, 200, you know the number. I think it's 1440, something like that, all right? That's the number, something like that. So is it worth it? Of course it is. This is how people look at numbers. As long as the client acquisition cost is less than the customer lifetime value, you are good. And so my point in this conversation about getting competition, stealing clients from your competition is now is the time to do it. So if there's a zero up here is now is the time. And then you're gonna identify those clients. Step one, shift your mindset. Now's the time to go after them. Step number two, identify your top 10, top 100. Step number three, let's put together a proposal that they're gonna like. And then you know that step number four is simply this. Let's put a plan together and take some action. Let's start reaching out to these customers. Uh, one of the programs I have is called uh, Predictable Prospecting. In other words, how to set up a rhythm for prospecting to go after those ideal clients. And I also have a program on upselling and cross-selling to sell them more. So. Anyway, I thought I'd share that with you. I thought it was pretty cool. So anyway, let me know what you guys think. Uh, let me see. So now I'll take questions. I know you guys have been typing and I haven't been. The Japanese have a say, we sell not to you, but to your grandchildren. There you go, man. Uh, suka, as they say. <laughs> Why does it say nani? What? So anyway, so hopefully if you have any questions, now will be the time to do them. Uh, let me see. I judge company by its heads and VPs. Yeah, I think that's, Sankin, I think that's probably the interview. It's a really good interview. In my telco industry, we call it customer value or customer lifetime value, absolutely. There's different names for it. But, I mean, think about this. It's, um, the story I have was years ago, uh, I was selling in Latin America. And I remember I ran into, uh, uh, it was an interesting situation where, and by the way, this goes under the topic of trying to get a client, right? But they already invested a lot of money. Uh, this is a true story, by the way. If you want to hear, here's a cool story. I'll hang out for this story. This is a really cool story. And then I'll tell you what happened at the end. There's, there's some, I got so many stories for you. I'm just like, uh, you know, sometimes I don't want to tell you these stories because you're listening. I go, really? That happened to you? I'm like, trust me, it happened. I got stories. And, but this was an interesting story. We were selling, tele, I was selling telecom equipment, right? And so there was this family, there were two families. Again, believe me if you want, but I'm not lying here. And so let's say this is family one and this is family two. I have to draw this out and you'll see why in just a bit. So two families run by two brothers, right? These are two brothers that are run, each run. 
Now, the interesting thing is that they're both running telecommunication businesses, right? Now, the interesting thing is both of these men who are brothers have sons, right? These are small sons, right? Now, they also know that their sons never listen to them. So here's what they did. This is really cool. So let's call it, let's go, let's say Bob, right? And John, right? Bob and John. And we'll call that little Bobby and little Johnny, right? So Bob sends his son, Bobby, to work for his brother, and his brother sends his son to work for the other one. Like literally like that. Blew me away. Now, this was a well-to-do family, right? And so each son, ready for it? When they turned 21, when they turned 21, they were each given $1 million to invest in a business. Yeah. Now, they had a lot of businesses, by the way. They, they were in telecom, but they were in a lot of other things, right? So they both gave their sons, almost the same age, $1 million to invest. So they both invested in building. They both, I guess, wanted to be in the telecom industry. And sure enough, they basically invested. Now, let's focus on this one right here, because this is the guy I did business with, right? So let's just kind of leave this one out. Nothing personal, just I didn't do business with them. So this young man, Bobby, little Bobby, LB, little Bobby, little Bobby, sounds like a rapper. Yo, little B. So little B, little Bobby, little Bobby puts his million dollars down, right? And invests in the system. And I think he spent about, I think it was like, I think he spent $700,000 on this, we'll call it system one. I'll call it system one, right? So system one. And basically, you know, it was like, like multiple tower sites, transmitters, all that stuff, right? Anything you need for telecommunications, right? Keeping it simple. The problem was his competitor, his cousin was killing it. He bought a different system and he was killing it with system two. So he bought system two and he was killing it. And so this kid's over here struggling. Little Bobby's struggling. Little Bobby's like, you know, I don't know what to do. My system, I invested all this money. So I don't know how he got to me, but he, he heard that, hey, I had a solution, call it system three. And he said to me, he said, he, I remember he approached me. He said, are you, are you Victor? And I'm like, yeah, I heard da, da, da. And he goes, yeah, I heard you're the VP of da, da. I said, yeah. He says, I have a problem. Can we talk about it? So I remember sitting down. I think we were in Miami, Florida, talking about it on the balcony. And he's a very intense kid for like 21, 20, 23 at the time, I think. He was really intense. And so long story short, he says, can you help me? And I said, let's talk. And he says, and I said, well, I can put together a system for you that I know that can compete against your cousins that I know we can win. He said, here's a problem. He says, I don't have the money. He said, I have $300,000 more or less. I mean, you know, uh, easy with the numbers here. He says, I can't afford your system, Victor. I can't afford it. I just spent $700,000 on this system. So I said, creative proposal. True story, creative proposal. So what I did was I said, look, I'll give you $300,000, right? for your system. Now, it wasn't a cash thing. Again, I used the discounting method here or the, the uh, buy down. So I said, I'll give you $300,000, right? Which is almost half your system. It's not working, so it's not doing anything. It's like, it's like a paperweight. It's not doing any good. And I said, I said my system cost $800,000, right? And he said, to which he said, I don't have $800,000. I said, I, I'll buy your system at three hundred. dollars That'll break this down to $500,000, right? Or rather, um, $3,000. So now you owe me $3,000. And what I'll do is I'll finance that over a five-year period until you get on your feet. Now, I'm still making money, right? Because I'm going to finance this. So I'm still making money. And so we agreed to the deal. And so we swapped out the system, but I'm not stupid. Watch. So this system originally cost $700,000. I bought it for $300,000, right? Now, I'm selling in Latin America. Here's what I did. So this is my deal, right? I'm only going to get... $300,000 financed over five years, right? That's what I'm really getting. What I then did is I took this system that I bought for $300,000 and I sold it for $400,000 in another country. So I talked to one of my other sales friends. It's basically, look, I got a system here I'm trying to get rid of. Uh, do you know any clients who are in the market for a system? So forth and so on. And we found somebody and they bought it for $400,000, which means I got at least, so to speak, $100,000 back. So really, I'm just financing, if I can bend numbers this way, I'm just financing 200K. But I'm making money over here. 
because I really, this is really cash that I'm getting. Here I didn't give any cash away. So if you add this, I mean, if we were to do the numbers properly, I would add $400,000 basically back into the actual equation. So this $400,000 wasn't really lost, or this 300 wasn't lost. I really got 400 in the end back. So I did make some money. But what I didn't take into account, this I really didn't think about, was that his business was going to grow. And so what happened was, once we put the system in, first year it was just, yeah, it, it meandered, right? We had to put the system in, it meandered. But what happened was, when we looked at his sales, basically almost nothing, the year one. But year two, we started seeing this. And then year three, he just like did one of these numbers. Total exponential. Now he had to expand his system. And because he had to expand his system, who was he going to buy from? The person that hooked him up. That's right, they bought from me. And so by the third year, we were killing it. He was killing it. I was killing it because he was buying from me. Now, how do I know that he was happy? Because I remember him and his uncle, remember, he works with his, for his uncle, not his father. He works for his uncle. Him and his uncle, uh, uh, I remember we invited me down to Miami. I was living in Minnesota at the time. A, hey, yeah, for sure, you betcha, all right? And he invited me to Minnesota, uh, to Miami. And I said, he said, uh, you know, we'd like to take you out to dinner. And so I remember they took me out to dinner. And, you know, we just had a nice conversation, basically celebrating this success, right? Well, at the, by the way, they picked me up in a limousine. <laughs> I got to emphasize that. Big limousine picked me up. Uh, went to a beautiful place, uh, just gorgeous place. Had a nice steak at steakhouse, beautiful, the whole thing. Uh, you know, pop, pop in the bubbly, you know. Uh, no, no Chris Dow, just regular bubbly. And so I remember at the end, they handed me a gift, right? They gave me a gift. And the gift, I said, I said, thank you. And he says, we'd like you to open it. So I opened it right there and then. And I popped it open and it was a watch. It was a show part. I don't know if you know what a show part is, but it's pretty expensive. It's like, I think Audemars Piquet, show part, you know, you know, Philippe Pitek and all those. It was a show part. And I was like, that's a nice watch. And I remember they drove me back to the hotel. You have to many thank yous, many uh, you know uh, signs of appreciation. Drove back, dropped me off at the hotel in the limo. And I remember that night I had to talk to my boss, and, he, and it was a she. And she said, "How'd it go?" I said, it "Went super well." They just wanted to thank me for this day, this deal, that deal, that deal, that. I said, "But I got to tell you something." I said, "They gave me a gift." And she goes, "What is it?" I said, "What's well, a watch?" I said, "I said, but the thing is, 